Okay, well, hello everybody. Today we're gonna have Eric. Eric is gonna tell us what his process is and give you some tips. Let's dive right into it. I think we had a very nice setup. I just want to go a little bit further because I think people want to know like exactly what my background is, what brings me in as the expert. I've worked with a lot of different international clients from Adidas to Apple to MasterCard, Nissan, a lot of work, Coca-Cola. That has brought me into this world of understanding how to find solutions for the different challenges that either the client identifies or you help the client identify. And I have over 50 awards doing this internationally, the coveted Ken Lions to Clio and effectiveness awards with Effies. Normally my work looks like this, which is usually whether it's a TV commercial or a campaign or a special digital project. And that's been done through my work with large network agencies like Gray, where I was creative lead, TBWA, where I was creative director, and most recently McCann as uh, executive creative director. So that's what my work normally looks like and going and narrowing that focus down into a more product focused is what I've done recently with generative AI. And that's where these three projects got a lot of attention. So these projects are featured in Fast Company, Ad Age, Forbes. I think this is why everyone is here today to take a look at behind the scenes, how does this work get created? I wanna show you something that I haven't shared before. I wanna show you a lot of the fails because there is a lot of like failure in this search. And I'll give you my best reasoning why I think it failed, I think we can talk about what to look out for. And I want to jump into the question because everyone keeps on asking me, you know, which one do you use? There's a great answer to that that came from a YouTuber. His name is Matt Wolf. This is a fantastic site. It's called futuretools.io. This is probably a very valuable thing just to get from this meeting. It has 1,600 different AI apps and it has everything from chatting to text to doing coding to doing speech to doing generative AI for images. I think this is a really great way to have on hand all the tools and it has all the news that's being generated about AI. I think it's probably the most in-depth site right now that's not covered in advertising. If you ask me personally what I use, I'm really only using OpenAI's ChatGPT, Google Bard, because I think there's some places where Google Bard does a better job. Mostly I want to focus on image because I think that's where me and my design background and my art direction and aesthetic background is going to be probably more valuable. There's really mid journey, which is the main one. The reason why I have listed here stable diffusion is because it's such a technical program. But if you are just skimming the surface, I think the model that you're going to get with mid journey is much better. And what I want to show is the work that's been done that kind of compares the three main image generators on the market. There's Dolly, mid journey and stable diffusion. This is a comparison done by Wade McMaster. And you see right down the middle, I mean, mid journey is just on another level as far as creating atmosphere, having the stylization and mid journey has done a lot more to stay ahead of the curve in that situation. And just aesthetically what it produces, I think is better. So I would guide everybody towards using mid journey. That's really where I think you're going to see a lot more impact from your prompts. And I think you're going to be much more pleased with the work that comes out of it. A lot of people are talking about the potential of AI and, and what does this mean and how it's going to revolutionize the market and how it's going to make all projects different. I'm kind of tired of the word, the potential, because usually this means like so future and forward thinking like 10 years from now. When AI first came out at the beginning of this year, like everybody was making images of like astronauts riding unicorns. Later, people were talking about how Everyone's going to be unemployed in the design industry, in the advertising industry. I thought that like this is crazy. There's got to be some like practicality and some steps in between what's going on here. And I didn't want to look 10 years out or three years out. What, what's important for me right now is to focus on today and what we can do. Today, if you logged in to MidJourney and you had a task from a client and you needed to create a prototype for a self-tightening strap system for a harness and you actually briefed mid journey for this. What comes out, and this is a real example that was done by D2M, it looks very interesting, but the practicality behind it might be limiting. You know, their real product, which they created, looked more like that on the right hand side. It has this more ease of use. It's it's the design is more human. It has less moving parts. What I want to pinpoint with you today is the type of prompts that you need to choose and what's the work behind those prompts that you have to do to decide in your mind about what your vision is for the project. One more example from D2M, a compartmentalized backpack system for storing food. This is the actual brief which they had from a client. It doesn't look like it was done by mid journey. I think that this was done by like stable diffusion. You can see that it's kind of like sloppy and the logic 
of why these different foods are separated. Why is it in a box? Is it not in a box? It's not very good. Compared to the actual product which they designed, you can see it's a lot more practical and pragmatic in their approach where you have this little drawer that slides out and the food might be separated like that. What I could say is that if they would approach this differently, they could design this food storage system and then go in to mid-journey and make more beautiful or aesthetically pleasing the external side of the bag because I'm sure mid-journey could do backpacks quite well. It's just the fact when you try to leave all of the logic to the AI to decide for itself which compartments should hold which food, it becomes too many instructions wrapped up into one and it's not very good at answering those types of questions very fast. When I did the Patagonia and Ikea project, it was the first project that I did. It was like January and it got so much hype. I think it was easy to do that project because Ikea has so many different types of styles when it comes to their furniture. There's not so much consistency there. And I wanted to do something that was more like exclusive with high consistency because this is one of the big challenges when it comes to AI is how can I make sure that the objects that I'm creating have a consistent color code or pattern or style. That's why I came up with this British Airways and Burberry idea. Uh, in addition to some of the challenges that British Airways was facing at the time, some of the rebranding that Burberry was going on. These are both like very hot topics. But I asked myself, you know, what would that actually look like as an interior? And that's when I got these images that we saw a little preview of before. But I want to show you, I think what's much more interesting, the fails that happen here. Because it takes you a while to find that groove. And I failed a lot. And uh, I want to show you what some of those fails were. So this idea of Burberry and British Airways, it was sitting in my mind for a while and I actually didn't launch it because the first time I had spent like two days and, and created really bad images, something was not right with my prompts. The actual prompt was a first class British Airways seat made of material with the iconic Burberry pattern, British Airways and Burberry branding, airplane interior. And it, it seems like logical as a prompt. What I got back was, was pretty, I don't know, expected as a design, I think. But it put wine glasses directly on the seat, which is like when you're doing something that's that's high luxury, you have to think of etiquette and the codes of etiquette. And it's not a good idea to put a wine glass like on a chair if you're going to do product photography. It looks like a used napkin is next to it. And when I look up above, this isn't a British Airways logo. It's not a Burberry logo. It's just like some extra thing that was on there. And it kind of got me to ask the question, like, how does it compare to a real British Airways first class seat? And I didn't think we were moving the needle as far as revolutionizing first class for British Airways. To the untrained eye, it looks very similar. And that's when I said, okay, I've got to go back to do something different. I'm going to show you a couple more fails. I wrote something different. A first class airplane interior with designs from Burberry, fashion. And fashion was a separated word from here. And what came back, it kind of like went to this weird world of pastels and like peach colored and the designs were over designed. And I think that it came from the keyword fashion that kind of was that that wrench in the gears that just threw us into the wrong trajectory. And that's what you have to do when you see images that look like this is take a look back at your prompt and try to dis discover what actually made the problem and, and, and think how does a machine interpret the words that you're using. You'll see that I didn't use British Airways in this prompt. And the reason why was because the previous image where you saw that the British Airways chair looked very standard. It looked like the expected traditional British Airways first class seat, which is, it's not something new. It's not going to make headlines. It's not going to get you PR. And that's why I left out British Airways, because what I understood is when I used British Airways first class inside of my prompt, it gave the signal to mid-journey to think of its library of all of the different British Airways first class interiors and to sample that as a reference. And I didn't want to do that because what I was trying to do is revolutionize. I was trying to change the interior of British Airways first class. So I understood that it was giving too many cues to mid-journey to use that design style of an existing British Airways chair system. And that's why I ended up just saying first class airplane interior. This is another fail. Accessories for first class passengers with the iconic Burberry textile pattern, product photography. It probably sounds very harsh to say it's a fail because it's still pretty amazing that AI is generating this. But when I look closer, 
I don't know if this is a pillow or if it's a bag. It seems to have this belt system to fasten it and to open it up. The headphones are kind of cool, and that kind of gave me a cue that I should be doing headphones. It would be a really good idea. But together in this whole layout, it was not so specific as an object. I didn't know if it was a purse or a pillow, and that didn't make me very confident. Here's another one. A male model wearing a Burberry design sleeping mask. It looks like Batman. <laughs> it looks like a superhero. It's fused into his face in some places. You're, you're going to find that some of your prompts, it's weird, but sometimes the AI has a bad day. Or with some wording, it has a, you know, just a bad trajectory with it. And I found a big challenge with rendering a sleeping mask on the face of a person for some reason. I wrote also sleeping comfortably and peacefully on a first class airline seat. The reason why I kind of wrote out so much description was because AI will interpret based off of its image data set. And some of those might be stock photos, you know, where it has somebody like snoring with their mouth open. It might not be very comfortable when you think about the stereotype of what it's like to sleep in an airplane. So I tried to make sure to articulate within that wording that it's going to be comfortable and peaceful, but it threw off the images and entirely. And I'm going to show you some worse ones here. Maybe you feel like I'm being too harsh with the system, but if you're going to use these images as something to show to the client afterwards, the client's going to scrutinize in a much more specific detail than I am right now. I wanted to have Burberry branded slippers and separately a sleeping mask neatly set on a first class airline seat. And what happened here, I guess that's a slipper, which is kind of like fused together. And then it looks like swimming goggles <laughs> that are on top of the slippers. And uh, it couldn't separate these two objects very well. When I wrote them and it, because so many people have been going into mid journey and saying a fusion of this and a fusion of that, I think that it's been training the AI to kind of fuse things that you want and trying to put them together. So you have to approach prompting a little bit differently when you want separate objects inside of there. This was a fail for me because I thought that this prompt for a ticketing system, it looked kind of like old school. It looked like it was made in the 1950s. And I tried to write in here, you know, modern Burberry designed airline ticket, but it didn't reflect something that I thought looked very modern. If I'm trying to curate a design code of what it means to be at the cutting edge of luxury, I, as an art director, need to reject some images or maybe even reject some products which I'm not having a good time creating. So in this case, I think I gave like five different prompts for this. And at one point I got tired of waiting and I just said, okay, I'm going to do away with the ticketing system because the tickets are not looking very interesting. It's going to throw off my flow when it comes to creating this project. You know, at one point I started to get more into the models that I wanted to see that were enjoying this new recreated first class of Burberry in British Airways. And maybe at a distance, this might look good, but like when you start to, to pay attention closer, it looks like, like a keyboard, which is embedded into the window. And normally in, in first class, you're not forced to look directly out the window. Normally in first class, you're, you're looking forward and the window is on your right, your left-hand side. And there's not much leg room here. I don't know if he's playing with an iPad. There's a couple of problems here with the fingers. It's kind of like in different directions. And I don't see the design code of Burberry in here. So for some reason, it's made a misinterpretation. And I thought that I could just, you know, I was giving it a test. I wrote that it should be an advertisement. And I tried to put some text inside of there, if that's body copy down below. And it might be an interesting spot to put a bit of text, but it's so far off as far as the image. And even he might look a little bit cross-eyed. I can't tell where he's looking. I decided this is not the image. And then where I had a lot of challenges was when I briefed Midjourney to do more than one model. I wrote a Burberry photo shoot of models relaxing in an airplane first class. I wanted to see this sort of like vibe, this sort of mood, this lifestyle of relaxing in luxury. And I threw it this challenge, but the image that I got, it looks like she's a corpse <laughs> lying down. There's a lot of different limbs that are coming out from there, which is a bit bizarre. It looks like a bad dream, you know, uh, it looks a bit like a nightmare. You know, you have this melting face, you have these hands that the fingers look like feathers or something. And uh, I understood that this was like a bad day for mid journey and it wasn't going well. And there was going to be some images that I just had to forget and move on and to start prompting in a different way. So the prompts that got me the right images, I'm going to show you right now. And I haven't shared these prompts anywhere else. So this is kind of exclusive to this meeting today. The first one, I want to point out to you how concise and short it is. 
Burberry branded luggage tag. And what came back was very simple, very elegant. I didn't write here that it was product photography. I didn't write that it should be beautiful. I just wrote Burberry branded luggage tag. It's kind of like a tongue twister there. Generated another one. I didn't like exactly it, but I wanted to see what my options were. And then finally, I got this one, which I thought was the best. And that was the one that I decided to upscale. Maybe there's some problems with the text, but I could imagine that this, even I could probably be confident enough to show it to the client and say, you know, there's some problems with our stitching here, but when we, when we get the right wording on there, it could be a, a great souvenir to give out to people that would ride in this new first class redesigned by Burberry. The next one, Burberry branded sleeping mask, neatly set on a first class airline seat. Again, you'll notice that I omitted British Airways because I was trying to revolutionize what British Airways first class looked like. And what came back were these images where I would say there's a lot of problems. I looked at this and I said it looked too cheap. You know, this one looks like the pillow is actually a person's face. It looks kind of cartoony. I don't know what this is here. Maybe it's like a neck pillow. I, I liked more or less the coloration and the direction that it was going in. But, you know, if I had a team of designers, I don't think I would receive this type of mistake where it looks like it's sunglasses. So what I did was I selected this image and I said that I want to make variations based on this image. And what Midjourney did is it came back and made one with a little bit more texture that was on there. It looked like a visor. You know, this one looks a little bit more soft. This one has some extra leather things that are sewn into it. And I liked this one the most because it just sort of seemed like this nice panel. It represented enough the very traditional classical sleeping mask that you would have, but it had some nice premium elements that were inside of it. But I didn't know what this was up above. It was like a hat or a piece of cloth. And I don't think Midjourney knew what it was either. And that's when I came back and I said, okay, let's do more variation based on that. And I like this image the most. And when I selected this image, I clicked on upscale. And I want to show you, you know, the difference this was what was generated the first round. And when I upscaled it, it looked very different. There were some new added details. And that's something you can expect when you upscale some of the images in Midjourney. It was a happy mistake. It's a fluke, but I love the way that the material that's in the pillow here looks a bit more premium than the fuzziness of what's going on over here. I love that somehow it created this trim around the, the visor. It looks like it's something that would protect the light from exposing your eyes. And I liked what I had here. Another winning prompt, Burberry branded business class airplane interior. Take a look at some of the other challenges that we're looking at here. I don't know where your legs go in this one. It looks like there's a screen here for you to look at, but there's not a back of a chair to support your back when you look at that. So there's not a lot of logic which is going into the AI. It's really making decisions, especially in mid-journey more based on aesthetics. I don't know what this is. It's kind of like blocking the view. And I don't know if this is like a cockpit or something like that. Here is probably more closer to something traditional and it looks a little bit expected as far as the external side of it. And that's why I chose this one. So I decided let's make some variation based off of this. I didn't like some of the patterns. I didn't know how it would look when I would finally upscale it. So I, I decided to go with some variation here. And I got a couple of different types of styles. It looks like a glitch as if this is like a 3D object. So I decided to forego that one. And that's when I focused on this one because I thought that the pillow looked cool as far as the design went. I liked that as far as the chair being divided, it looks less divided in this image. And uh, I decided to upscale it. And I, I flipped the image because when somebody sees this image, they should naturally assume that this would be comfortable to sit in. I have the feeling that this is like with your back facing the cockpit. And I want it to be the other way around where your face should be facing the cockpit, the front of the aircraft. And that's why I just did a, a quick flip. It kept and retained the single glass that was there, but it used this little glitch and it reinterpreted that little glitch as two glasses on the window, which I thought was kind of weird, but it was okay. It was good enough. And I kind of like packaged that and I, I let it go on. I want to show you just lastly, a couple of the final prompts, which kind of sealed the deal for me. British Airways and Burberry redesigned the first class experience. When I teach people how to do prompts, this is one of the ways that I explain it, is that if you think of your idea as a headline, you know, a headline is very reduced amount of words, really just includes the most important elements to describe what, what happened. And that sort of headline, if it was going to be in a newspaper or a journal, might be the best way sometimes uh, to get the image that you want. And that created a really nice mood for me. I like that image.
Burberry branded accessories and stationery. From a distance, it looks cool. It was a nice complimentary image to add into the mix. But if I really look detailed into what's going on here, I don't know what these are. They look like these little, it looks like a Q-tip or like little paint brushes. Maybe it's a makeup kit. I'm not sure what it is. The stationery is there. I don't know if these are, are chopsticks. I don't know if it, it used to be maybe in the process. It was the cap to this pen. And it was left over here, but at some point it became elongated when it was rendering. And these are some of the challenges that were that were happening with those types of images. But I decided it was good enough to kind of keep in the mix. And then this was like a very separate idea. I made a list of so many different objects that I wanted to see. And then I created those objects separately rather than trying to insert into this image, this lady eating dinner. I created those separately so that in the viewer's mind's eye, you kind of connect all these objects together. And what I think about when I'm trying to create a series of images that would explain an idea, I think about, you know, how would a director if who's shooting a film approach the same sort of material? And a director doesn't rely only on medium shots or long, long view shots or wide frame shots where you can get all the information. A director will sometimes hone in on little details, whether it's the zipper, whether it's uh, some of the fabric or the material is there. And that's what I'm trying to do is, is give space for the AI to focus on some of the separate objects that I'm interested in having, rather than trying to get all the objects all at once in one image, which will take forever. So I ended up getting nine selected images, which were the ones that I posted on LinkedIn and Instagram and ended up getting republished everywhere. But it was from 200 images, which I made that selection from. And I generated in total these 200 images, and it took me two days to do that. So what I want to really double down on is the fact that there's so much intervention to make this. And so when people tell me, you know, they look at these ideas and they go, oh, that's fantastic. AI did all of this. And I have to stop them and say that this is not automation entirely. And that's where I want to focus again on what is happening today. Today, successful AI projects are guided and cherry-picked with many hours of human involvement. And I can guarantee you, if you're seeing anything online where it's a new project from AI goes viral, you're looking at the final product, which was so procured, and there was so many revisions and edits that were made until you got to that, where AI was assisting the person that wasn't taking over the project entirely. There's no magic button where you can just click generate a new idea that's going to be incredible and get this amazing originality from AI. You as the individual have to decide that for yourself. So where we are is really right now, we're at the AI assisted stage of the innovation curve. Maybe later on, it might be this magic tool which decides things for you. I think that AI is doing some great things as far as looking at quantitative data and digesting a large data set. It might give you some advice on something, but you as the individual have to make the decision based on what you think is right in the end. And you can choose to accept what the AI gives you. You can choose to reject it. Creativity is still very human. And I don't think this is going to change very fast. Uh, and usually in the process of creation, I, I start with defining the idea. You know, what is the brief internally that we have the team work on? And what are the deliverables that we need to have for this idea? You know, so if I'm going to do something with Burberry, like what are the different products that we should create? It might be something from some strategic point of view, and it might be left open for the creative team to kind of dive in and, and make some of those decisions for themselves. Then you have exploring these expressions, and those are so many different sketches and reference images and mood boards about how that might come alive, that you kind of expand and expand in, in the several days that you have. And then you, at one point, start to curate and redefine what it is that you want. And that's where you remove images that might be clutter. You remove what might be noise, what's maybe distracting to the core essence of the idea. And that takes a lot of high-level thinking. And whether that's a team decision or it comes from an executive creative director to decide that, there's still a required human element to make that call. And then when you want to go present it, whether it's to your client or to the public or to for PR to a journal, you're going to have to package it in a beautiful way so that the public will understand the concept that you have. So this is like the normal process of creation that we have. And this is where I think AI fits in. A lot of people have been asking me, what does that mean for advertising? And what does that mean for innovations or creating new concepts for a brand? Doesn't that mean that you can just 
fire designers or art directors and let the AI take over. And I don't think that that's a replacement. I think that it's a parallel process right now. Today, definitely it's a parallel process. And I don't think that it should replace anything else that's going on. So when I define the idea, I'm going to validate it with AI. Here's an example. I would go to ChatGPT and I would say, if Burberry and British Airways made a brand collaboration to redesign first class, what are some products and accessories they could create for the brand collaboration? List 30. And it would come back with this list. Amenity kits for toiletries. It says cashmere blankets, monogrammed leather passport holders. It has everything from like coasters for your drink, slippers. And that's a great list where I don't have to sit and think too much for myself. I could look at that and say, and cherry pick which ideas I think are right. I will use that idea. Or I might say that is not a great idea, but it inspires me to counter with a different idea, which might be the headphones, for example. Maybe the headphones were a great idea that ChatGPT didn't come up with originally. So that's where I think that validating with AI is a great way to just check your work, to check your thinking, to kind of see like if AI would approach it, what would they do? I think that's a very useful tool to have in your toolkit. And I think that also when you go to your expressions, you know, explore with AI. That's what we've really shown today. I think another way is, you know, if you have a, a product sketch, and maybe it's taken you hours to kind of come up with this and to isolate this idea. You can do this image to image where you feed this image into mid journey. You're going to have to write a prompt, you know, to describe what this image is. It's a concept sketch, detailed orthographic gaming mouse, silver and orange. And what comes back, this is really interesting. It doesn't show the exact design, but it does give some new ideas. If you're stuck in a spot, you can feed an image into mid-journey and you could see it might be a cool idea to hollow out the inside of that mouse. It might make it lighter or it might be an additional button that I want to have inside of there. But what I can say is you got to be careful because a lot of the images that mid-journey is spitting back is based off of an average of what are real and already existing devices in the world. I think that this is a lot more original what the artist created. So when it comes to packaging for presenting and you want to enhance it with AI, I think there's another use case, which is really good. So this is an image that was created in Midjourney, and this is a small boutique brand. It's these CBD gummies. So they actually, when they created this image in Midjourney, they prompted for all of these berries in the background. They got that image that we showed on the left-hand side. And then what they did was they took the actual container for the gummies and they photographed it in a more or less the right angle so they could get the shadows and the shading that kind of matched up. And then they photoshopped it and kind of mashed it all together and mixed it up so that they had this beautiful background to present their product so it would look a lot more desirable and appetizing rather than just having this sterile white bottle there. So that looks a lot more flavorful to us. And that's where I think that AI sort of fits in this process of creation as a parallel additional system instead of replacing something that you are already doing. So which processes are future-proof or more safe? I think if you have any process that's going to be this back and forth with the agency and the client to define what the client needs and the client gives some feedback about adjusting something, there's this collaboration that happens in between a client and agency that an AI cannot replace. And a lot of times you're like a, a psychiatrist for the client to help them decide between so many different stakeholders, whether it's the marketing director or the head of the brand or even the general director of the company. They might have different visions and you need to go back and help them explore what those visions are so that you can, you can get to the final result. And it's really difficult for AI to do that. And it's very difficult often for these companies to sit in the driver's seat and to do everything with their own hands. This is why they're hiring an agency. I also think that highly original thinking, if you're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, you're in a very safe spot because if you're doing something that's more standard or cliched, AI is great for just generating thousands of those types of results. But the moment that you come up with that new, if it's a fusion idea or it's a new way of thinking, the origin of it is gonna be inside of your head. And you're going to have to prompt for it. AI is not really going to spit it out. And you're going to see that a lot of things that even come back from chat GPT, they're kind of standard. They're kind of expected. They're a little bit cliche. It's not possible to go back and just say, be more original or do something less cliche. 
because it doesn't understand those. It's already giving you ideas that are sourced from its large data set. And because it's a large data set, it's already going to be, you know, this average of all these different ideas that are there. And then taste and curation, the human aspect of looking and deciding what stays and what is discarded, I think is very important. When I did work with Apple internally, they always said for every yes, there's a thousand no's. It definitely relates to what we're doing in any of these processes here when AI is involved. You're going to have to say no many times and discard the things that you think that do not work. So today, this is how I'm going to wrap up. AI is more of an accelerator to your process. It's not a replacer. And I hope that answers a lot of questions around my process, around the way that I think the right way to prompt AI and to leverage AI in your process is. If you want more information on my prompts and process, I have two videos that are on YouTube that go really deep into the Jeep and North Face brand collaboration. And because there's been so much demand from the IKEA and Patagonia project, I've made a very in-depth video that talks about the entire process and which images failed and why they failed and which products I decided to highlight and why I decided to highlight them. You can find that all on my YouTube. And here's my links when you want to see more of those types of content and more information on the projects that I've been doing. Do you have the first question, please? Yep. Uh, and we, as Brandon said, we've been going through the questions. I know some of them have been answered through the presentation, but I don't think we got to this one. Uh, does prompt writing work similarly to search engine hacks, such as using a symbol like colon or dash on Google to search specific intent? Or specify the intent, sorry. Yeah, so it depends on the, the AI tool that you're using. When it comes to mid-journey, there is a whole instruction manual. It's like, I forget how many, you know, 50 pages, something like that. And you can read through the manual if you really want to get into those details. You can go on YouTube and, and do a, a search for like prompt structure. There's so many different theories about how to do it. What I found works for me the easiest is trying to use more natural language. What you can do if you're trying to, if you get an image back, let's say you're trying to fuse two things, there's a code that you can type in. You can add more weight to different words, writing uh, you know, a 10 or a 100 next to the weight of the word that you want. And then you can reduce the weight of the second word because maybe AI is paying too much attention to one of the words that's inside of there. And likewise, sometimes you'll get an image that comes back and you might say it's a cool direction, but something is not going well. And you can choose for more variation on one of those images. But I can tell you in my experience, in a lot of the back and forth that you'll have in the AI, it will sometimes degrade the image. And that's really how I got those nightmare images of like all the models with the fingers that were out of control. And you know, it looks like a corpse is laying down was because I, I tried to give it too many different commands. There's a lot of keyword stuffing that people are trying to do when it comes to their prompts. But, you know, I remember at the beginning of this year, people were writing in like, it must have 4K. It should say Unreal Engine. It must say that it's a uh, super high resolution. I, I didn't see that the quality that was coming back from that was making it much better. I felt like it was wasting my time to type all that stuff out. When you look at the tools and, and how fast they update, by the time you think you've nailed something down, it's already, you know, magnitudes easier to do the next week. All I can say is if you're in the creative process, the more that you experiment with this is the more that you're gonna feel comfortable with one tool or the other. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, uh, Eric, you've actually used Midjourney 4, I believe, for IKEA, and you used Midjourney 5 for Jeep. There was already some huge differences, right? Yeah. Um, it also adds some, like, camera angle, right? Like, bird eye or portrait or whatever, and it makes a huge difference in the output as well if you're trying to get, like... Yeah, so even, even when you type in a prompt, you can add in, you know, afterwards. Maybe you like something and you say, I'd like to see from the left-hand view or I want to see from the passenger view. You can, you can add in those words. Sometimes it'll work. Sometimes it'll not be so good. I think just like a director speaks to a storyboard artist, you have to think in those more cinematic terms because that's how you're going to articulate the image and what you want to see. That being said, it's really okay to come in if you don't really have a vision about what angle it's going to be at. It's really okay to come in and just sort of like try to narrow it down to what are the core elements you want to see in the image. You know, right now there's version 5.1 with Midjourney. And if you type in a dog, 
it comes back with some really beautiful images that don't look like photography. They look very stylized. They look like they have this sort of like neon backgrounds. So Mid Journey has been going in this trajectory of being a lot more stylized now. You don't need to give it much instruction to get it. Cool. Um, Brandon, do you have a question, I believe, around how can you actually give Mid Journey a picture to work with? Oh, yeah. Uh, so that was one question. How often do you use image prompts when you're generating your stuff to kind of guide either a framework or a setting or an angle? Or do you just strict primarily, uh, sorry, do you restrict your prompts primarily to text? There is a project that I've done recently. I'm not going to tell it now because it's kind of like in development. But I, I did upload a library of images to MidJourney to get it familiar with a brand that it didn't know before, and it didn't seem to help. It didn't really seem to help. It's a feature that MidJourney says that it does. It seems to work well when you're dealing with faces, but when it comes to more abstract geometric objects, it seems to have some issues with that. It seems to read from the images that you upload less the content when it comes to the objects, but more of the style that you're uploading. And it uses that reference of color code and style as a way to dictate what the outcome is going to be. If that's really an important factor, the ability to upload an image and then to edit it through AI, MidJourney is not the best tool for that. There's Dolly where you can highlight some things that you want to adjust or, or change. You can get lost going into Stable Diffusion. There's so many ways to even use Stable Diffusion. You can use it online. You can download it locally onto your computer. And if you have a good graphics card and a lot of RAM, you can do it on your computer and you can modify and manipulate the code in Stable Diffusion to create a model of it that doesn't exist anywhere else. And then you can add extra plugins on top of that so that you can start to sketch in Stable Diffusion and it will turn that sketch into something else. The issue for me, coming from a design and art direction background, is that the images that come out of Stable Diffusion just on a purely aesthetic view I don't think look as good as the images that come out of MidJourney. And that's why I focus more on MidJourney. If I was building something for an enterprise or for an agency, and I said, we need to have a lot more control over what we're doing, we need to bring more standardization to this process, then I might focus more on, on installing a server with Stable Diffusion on there and starting to experiment more with these different control nodes you can put inside of there. But I think what I'm explaining to you right now, it might take thousands of hours of individual work to build and to get up and running. Whereas in a month, a new product might come out on the market where it costs only $15 a month, you know, to have a subscription to it. Again, experimenting and figuring out what is right for, for you and your needs is going to be the easiest way. So Eric, we've talked a lot about uh, photorealism. Why are you we're trying to, we're trying to how far can it go? How good can it be? How good for a brand? Now, let's talk about the opposite. Sometimes in our world, we actually don't want to show clients a final project that we can't really do it. We actually want something very sketchy, very like temporary, because we're trying to get people to not get completely like enamored with it, right? So, have you tried to do some like sketch pencil that are by design kind of supposed to be like low fidelity? And how is this working out for you? I haven't done it myself. I showed an example today of a product designer that inputted their own images and their sketches. One of the things that I've seen people do is they type in a blue line sketch of this object as if it's a product design process. And you can see all those different variations come into play. I think if you're in the industry, it's a great way for you to maybe not to show the client immediately, but to consider as a team, which design elements do you want to extract from that? What I can say is that a lot of people in, in the industry, you know, usually you hire a designer. And the reason you hire a designer is because of the illustration ability. And often you can overcome a lot of those problems just by, by working with somebody who has the talent to sketch that. Because when it comes to that sketchiness, which is a great way to articulate an idea without the client asking too many questions, but why that color, why that material there? You're more talking about just the structure of the object and the, the functionality of it it's easier to kind of sketch it yourself. For me, it's easier to sketch it myself probably because of my history of doing illustration and design. Okay. Have you also, we talked about like product design today. Have you tried to experiment around like survey design, like somebody entering a coffee shop? Have you tried to actually get something more like conceptually around like 
humans doing something and not so much about a product. I understand where that fits into your process. Like when you go into consulting and you want to say like, you know, imagine we have this scenario where I've used it is when, when you're trying to reveal to a client what a great TV commercial might look like, you know, you might have 30 seconds for that TV commercial. And in those 30 seconds, you're going to have maybe 10 to 15 different angles, depending on how complex that story is. And what a client normally has in my industry is a scene by scene objective. Why do we have to spend money when you take a, a shoot that might cost, I don't know, $200,000 to go shoot this? I mean, you divide that across 10 frames, so it costs $20,000 per frame. Why do we have to spend $20,000 on this frame? What's the objective there? What are we nailing down? Whether that's the informing the audience about how you use that product or if it's giving more of the branding codes. So when someone goes to the retail shelf, how are they going to find it and recognize it? So I, I've used it in that case, and I think it's pretty strong. What I can say is that it's combined with a lot of Photoshop in order to get what I want. You know, Sometimes it's going to come out perfect. Sometimes I'm going to recrop, add a little logo somewhere. I might readjust the coloring that's going to be inside of there. Yeah, we're just going to keep it like very you know, um, easy for non-designers to use the tool. And if you've described that very perfectly today, anyone can actually go and actually just get some really good uh, resolution of, of pictures. Um, if you feel okay, we have more questions. Um, yeah, sure. Brendan, do you have one more question? I think our final question here is from Albert. Uh, he says, Eric, wonderful presentation and thank you for sharing. During thank the you, practice for the presentation stage, how have your storytelling and brand strategy development with generative AI to get to create the why? Why would a customer want want a Burberry experience on BA? Why would Burberry want this brand collaboration? And he says the images and ideas are compelling assets, but looking deeper, what's the meaning of the Burberry uh, slash you know uh, British Airways collab that would tie into a new brand and product concept worth investing? Can ChatGPT help with that? You know the brand strategy narrative. Would it describe the starting point? Like I. I, I interpret this ultimately as where are you going with this? I didn't touch a lot on ChatGPT as the as a background as far as helping you discover what's the power behind a lot of these ideas. And I showed in the presentation where it says you can validate the idea at that point. I think that there's a very great way where you can sort of check your thinking with ChatGPT or Bard. If you have a concept in your mind, you can say, if this was to happen, or imagine that you're a marketing director, or imagine you're creating this new, whether it's a product or campaign or idea or innovation, why would it work? I think is a really great question to AI because it will come back with all these reasons about why. Or you can also say, why would it not work? You're going to look a lot more knowledgeable on the topic when you've considered the advantages and disadvantages to the idea. If you're asking me specifically about the Burberry and British Airways idea, like the why, for me, and what kind of like made me come up with that idea. I think, first of all, I understood that there's a new creative director at Burberry. They had just come from last year making the Burberry, I think it was called Spaces. It's a TV commercial where it's people that were floating on these wires over a field. And there was so much hype around this TV commercial where these people were flying around using practical effects. And they just used like CGI to erase the wires of these people flying. So you've got this very realistic flying idea I thought was very cool, how it would easily transition into British Airways. And then what I saw from British Airways is that I, there was a statistic where you, you do a lot of research when you're, when you're working on different brands and you have all, these, all this data that comes by your table. And one of the things that I saw was that airlines, it was something like they, they earn... 10 times more from one first class ticket sale as far as profit goes than they earn from an economy cabin class sale. And when you read the headlines, there were so many problems with British Airways talking about cutting employees, not being able to reach revenue targets for the next year. In the UK in general, a recession on the horizon coming up. And I thought, what are two real big, expensive British brands that they could capitalize on? And why would it look cool if they merged together? So I, I put all this logic together and I wrote this out. I fed it into ChatGPT and I said, this is my thinking. What in addition could support this argument? What are some other things? And one of the things that came back that I actually included in the idea 
when I posted it online from ChatGPT, which was a unique perspective that I didn't consider that actually 40% of the sales for any Burberry product is generated by the Chinese market. And the Chinese, the way that they fly to London is in British Airways because it has a nonstop flight that goes to Shanghai. And I thought this is a great way with hard data. This could be a place where we can capture new customers in the air and already reach an existing audience that we know it's in high demand with. And that sort of sealed the deal for me. If you don't have any more questions, I want to thank Eric. Thank you so much for your time. It was a great presentation. If you do want to reach out to Eric, I'm going to assume that you are reachable. Any uh, um, deeper questions, so to speak, around uh, Eric's work, or if you want to hire Eric, um, just definitely get a hold of him on LinkedIn, on Insta, on YouTube. We'll, uh, we'll most likely be more than happy to, to help you through your, your own uh, uh, knowledge of the Agentive AI. If you want to see just more deeper into my process, you can go to YouTube. I put a lot of that stuff on there. What I'm mostly interested in, if you have you know, access to, to an interesting project or client or, or idea, I'd love to collaborate on something like that and, uh, and help you, whether it's from my background thinking, because I don't think it's just about me writing prompts for you, but I do think that the background thinking and then seeing where AI can fit into the process is a an extra improvement to the process that I can help contribute. I have one more question to mention prompts. We see on LinkedIn and other places, people are like, this is the perfect prompt. Use this prompt. Here is a list of 10 prompts. How do you feel about those? Um, try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, what I do for myself, I have a Google document and I also have a, like a, a PowerPoint where I just take screenshots and throw it in there all the time. This is a great prompt, or here's another use case, or here's how that might relate to the future when a client has a request for me and I can go back and take a look at that. I think that the best note takers are the people that internalize information and the ones that kind of know the answers to questions in the future that they might not have known natively. Eric, once again, a thousand thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Uh, this is a new tool. It's going to be here to stay. It's going to get better. So. Learn it, experiment with it, see what you can do with it. And hopefully we get to talk to you again soon about maybe a new tool or a new enhancement. That'd be great. I think this is the challenge to everybody who participated today. I think use this information that you've just received today while it's fresh. Go out and try to do something, whether it's one of the tools we discussed today, or even if it's just going to that website that I mentioned at the beginning and just seeing about another AI tool that might fit your industry a bit closer. And if you want to be seen as on the cutting edge of your industry, this is the push that you need right now, I think, to go ahead and experiment with it on that level. Happy to share with you these, these new insights that I had.